How's everybody doing today? Hanging in, yes? All right, my clock says 2.35, let's do this thing. We're all set, Terry, right? We're all set. Awesome. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, I have like so many things we wanna cover in the semester and, and um, I'm actually almost proud of the fact that we got this far into the semester without covering motion planning, but I keep running into things where, um, ah, if I just, do motion planning, then we can do a little bit more. Like if I was thinking, let's do a let's do a lecture on dexterous hands or whatever. But I if, if I can't talk about the trajectories of the fingers, then it gets very hard to talk about dexterous hands. So we're going to do motion planning this week, and it's not. Let's see, um, it's a super important, useful thing to set of skills to know. Um, I haven't avoided it uh, because it's bad or anything like that, uh, <clears throat> but. There is one, one slight caveat that I, that I have to give as we get started, which is that a lot of times um, motion planning is all about, um, it, you know, in particular, what we'll be talking about today is sort of kinematic trajectory motion planning, which is the problem of trying to find joint trajectories for your robot to sort of move through space, typically avoiding collisions at all costs in order to accomplish the task. And I sort of hate that. <laughs> like. Um, our robots are spending so much time thinking about super complicated geom geometric puzzles. Um, and it's cool that we can, and you should know how to do it. But I kind of hope that in like a few years, uh, we, we don't, we're not doing that because our, I think the reason we're doing that is because our robots are so afraid of bumping into something because when they bump into something unexpected, they gotta go, you know, it's very hard to write a controller that can handle all of that um, complexity and things go bad when you bump into things. And uh, I mean, humans, I think when we're reaching are probably not solving massive geometric puzzles in order to just reach out, they, we kind of reach out and if we bump into something, no big deal and, and uh, we keep going and I have sort of a, a hope that maybe our robots will be a little bit more like that. Having said that, um, let's talk about motion planning uh, because there's a bunch of things that we have left on the table so far. And I, like I said, I've avoided uh, having not talked about motion planning. For instance, you know, we, even our bin picking solution uh, was, uh, was sort of hanging on this very simple trajectory that we would design, which was uh, to solve for a pre-grasp pose uh, with our, you know, our initial hand, figure out roughly where we want to drop the object, and then just draw kind of a straight line to some, some safe waypoint in the middle in end effector space you know, and then a safe line down. Okay, if the, I mean, that, that got us to where we are so far in the, in the term, but if the world gets a little bit more crowded, a little bit more cluttered, if you have to reach into a refrigerator to grab something instead of uh, just coming down on an open bin, you know, then, then we're gonna need a little bit more uh, thinking about those trajectories. Or, you know, I think there's other cases where you have to automate it, uh, this process. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, a very important topic in manipulation research is the idea of mobile manipulation, which is, um, you know, you got your robot arms, but they're moving around because they're on a walking robot or on a wheeled base. And in a mobile manipulation context, you're going to be planning in a slightly different, even if they're simple open environments, they're slightly different environments every time. So cherry picking a couple of waypoints sort of doesn't work anymore. And you have to look at your current surroundings and do some motion planning. 
And I think even if you were doing bin picking for a living, right? If you wanted to like, um, you know, open up a, a, you know, start a startup on, on bin picking or something, you would still want motion planning because um, we're wasting all kinds of time going through this sort of conservative waypoint that we happen to pick. Uh, if you're gonna be moving your arm back and forth between bins all day long, you will do everything you can to try to figure out exactly the best trajectories to take when you go back and forth. Um, you'll try to ride on the joint velocity limits or acceleration or payload limits of your robot and, and just barely avoid collisions with whatever you picked up. You know, and that can make the difference of how many picks per hour you can do, which is, I guess, the metric. All right, so let's talk about motion planning. I'm going to jump right to the whiteboard. I um, went a little ambitious on the um, demo I was going to have you do today and, and therefore didn't quite finish it. But it'll be done and it'll be in the notes tonight and it'll be awesome. Um, a few too many, um, you know, sort of basic bindings and stuff I had to write to, to finish. I, I apologize. Um, okay. So, uh, Motion planning is a general term. Um, there are some great books on motion planning. Some of them, will, some people will use the term motion planning to include, for instance, writing a feedback controller or something like that. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about sort of the specific case of motion planning where your goal is to come up with a trajectory for the joints of your robot, which um, in almost all cases we'll just write as Q of T in order to accomplish some goal where Q is the joint angles, right? And uh, we just want some open loop trajectory of the joint angles through time. So how do we go about doing that? I actually think, um, <clears throat> although inverse kinematics sounds very simple, uh, if you understand the full glory of inverse kinematics, then motion planning is like just a little bit on top of that. So, so we're going to start with a, a more complete discussion of inverse kinematics than we've done so far. All right. Inverse kinematics, um, we wrote the forward kinematics as just a function, which in the, uh, the case we used the most so far, we wanted to compute, for instance, the pose of the gripper um, as some nonlinear function of my joint angles, right? So we could figure out just by applying sines and cosines, for instance, going forward in, in through, the, through the kinematic chain, applying um, our, our transformation matrix, uh, matrices, our spatial algebra operations recursively, we could take joint angles and turn them into an end effector pose. Right, and so inverse kinematics, I mean, well, what we did before was differential kinematics, right? Which was talking about the Jacobians, which was the partial of F partial Q. And that, and then we did some Jacobian pseudo inverse kind of stuff in order to write controllers that would in part, they would in velocity space go the opposite direction of trying to go from end effector velocity commands to joint velocity commands. So it's interesting that we solved part of the problem, but we kind of skirted one of the really hard problems there of actually solving for the inverse of this function. So inverse kinematics, IK, is talking about in its simplest form, the inverse of this, right? Which is gonna be a map from some something like the end effector poses. To our joint angles, okay? Now you won't be surprised, but people know a lot about inverse kinematics, or kinematics and inverse kinematics. And there's, there's a lot, um, I mean, it's been one of the important topics in robotics for roughly as long as robotics has been a discipline. Um, so you won't be surprised to, th to know that people have thought a lot about it. I actually, I was surprised to realize how strong some of our theoretical understanding of that is. And um, 
I can't help but just tell you the, a little bit of this, this connection, which I think is very cool, which is, um, it turns out a lot of the theoretical statements that we have about kinematics actually are, are based on the fact that we, our robot kinematics are almost always polynomial, right? So, um, meaning they're given by polynomial equations. Now you should say, what the heck? You know, why? I've seen sines and cosines and everything there. I've seen sine thetas, cos thetas, all kinds of things in, in, our, in our rotation matrices and the like. So how can we possibly say the kinematics are polynomial? Um, and why do we care, right? So, so the reason we care of getting it away from trigonometric forms into a polynomial form is that then we enter the realm of algebraic geometry and, and we know a lot about the zeros of polynomials, how many there are, um, you know, whether they, they live on an infinite dimensional set or they're discreetly different, you know, how, we even have pretty good tools for how to find them. Um, that could be actually, in, the, in this particular case, we have fairly simple versions of trigonometrics and we could probably apply some of those tools directly. But in the general case, the trigonometric functions are much harder to, to, to reason about. So if you, if you want a theorem saying like you have a finite number of solutions to your, your kinematics problem, then it's much easier to, to lean on the, the mathematics of polynomials. So how, uh, how on earth can, um, can I say that kinematics are polynomial? Well, um, let's, let me do a couple drawings in the, in the plane in 2D. Let's see a 2D um, rigid body. So normally, if I have some rigid body like this, normally I would describe it um, with, for instance, the position uh, the, in x, y, and then theta would be like three variables to describe for 2D pose, right? And if I'm going to describe the kinematics of that, like the position of any particular point on this, then it's going to be a nonlinear function, uh, a trigonometric function of theta, sines and cosines of theta, in order to do that. But there's another way to do it, which is to write instead, use a sort of maximal coordinates. We could write, for instance, pick two points on the, on the um, link. We'll call this one x1, y1, this one x2, y2, x1 y1, x2, y2 are a sufficient, certainly a sufficient description of the pose. If I have those variables, I can, I know everything about how to compute kinematics of other points on that rigid body. Um, but we also have a constraint, which is that the distance between those points is constant. The rigid body constraint is roughly that, um, you know, those distances. So the distance between point one and point two, let's even say the square distance, because that keeps it a truly polynomial if I avoid the square root, is some constant. Okay, this is a polynomial. These are just variables, and this is a polynomial equation, of course. And that is fundamentally why the fact that rigid body constraints are our distance constraints is, and is fundamentally why these things are polynomial. And then if I add a joint, for instance, let's say I, I can stick it in blue here. Let's say I say that X1 and X2 are actually a pin joint. Then what is that? That's just a, a few more constraints that would be um, saying that X1, let's say equals zero, Y1 equals zero. I've got a few more polynomial equations. And it's, it's interesting, it, you can play a counting game with polynomials, right? So if I have a, um, a polynomial, if I have three polynomial equations as I do here, you know, one, two, three, and four variables, then generically, I mean, you can find polynomials that, for which this is not true, but I, the, your, your average polynomial, unless you work hard to screw it up, that means, um, you know, you've got, you've still got one degree of freedom left. Okay, you have infinite solutions. Um, so that's always true. You all, in, in, in this case, you all, it, it, it's always true. But if you have the same number of equations as, as, uh, as variables, then you generically have a finite number of solutions. Okay, so let's see. Um, 
if we have now like a two link robot, for instance. If I were to just, I'm gonna just keep going on the same color here. I now have a second link and I parameterize this with, you know, X3, Y3, maybe there's X4, Y4 in here, but I have additional constraints that X3 equals X2, X4 equals, um, sorry, Y, oh, I screwed that up. I have X4 equals X2 in the way I wrote it, Y4 equals Y2, okay? So now I have two variables remaining. So you could, it's not surprising that this is a two degree of freedom robot and I have roughly two free variables here. If, however, I wanna solve now the inverse kinematics problem, and I wanna say, for instance, that um, I wanna solve the joint angles if I have X3 and Y3 in some particular configuration. Let's say I have X3 equals my end effector desired, X E E, okay. Y3 equals Y E E, and I'm trying to now solve for what um, what the kinematics must be. If you count them up, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. What, is, what did I do? Uh, I have six variables. Good, and and I should have exact. I should have the same number of variables as I have decision variables. So, what did I screw up? I have another one of these constraints for here. So that takes me down one. I have a constraint here and then I have six of those. So yeah, eight, eight variables and eight constraints, yeah. Because I also have the distance P3 minus P4 is a const. That means I have a finite number of, dis of solutions generically. And in particular, you know, this inverse kinematics problem of saying, you give me X, E, E, I could solve a bunch of polynomial equations and I could tell you there's exactly two solutions in this case. And the other solution is, you know, when the robot looks like this, right? Could satisfy all those same constraints. And that's the basic, you know, inverse kinematics problem. There's a super special case of that, which is, a six off robot. This is sort of the only one that really matters to, to uh, manipulation, I guess, in most cases. And I have a six, um, you know, a desired spatial pose, so. Which is six constraints from that. In that particular case, if you give me a six degree freedom robotic arm and a pose constraint for the end effector, I expect to have finitely many solutions to that problem. Okay. And there are good software tools that, uh, that people still, that people use to solve that problem quickly. One of them is called IK fast. I've got a link to the, you know, to the documentation and stuff for that in the notes is that's something you'll hear people talking about using IK fast, which is roughly a closed form solution, which you give me the six degree of freedom um, end effector and a description of your robot, it'll solve, the, it'll compile a little piece of code that will quickly, very quickly solve your joint angles, the inverse kinematics problem. And for things like the actual orientation constraints and representations, you can play the same, use similar tricks to say this line is pointing in that direction for the X axis and the Y axis and the Z axis and things like that. And that's how you get polynomial orientation constraints or representations. Aha, yes. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly what you said. So, right, if you had, if you had an orientation constraint, you could write that again as um, something like, you know, this, this line is a dot product with your, your desired angle, for instance, and you can stay polynomial in that. There's one case where, I mean, so so a revolute joint, of course, is a one degree of freedom joint. It in 3D, 
it takes two bodies and writes a total of five constraints to lump to, to drop them down in order to get you down to one. Okay, every time you add a body, you subtract five constraints by adding a revolute joint. And prismatic joints, revolute joints, like all of our favorite joints for robots are have this case where you're polynomial. You can write everything polynomially. There is one case where you can't, which is if you've <laughs> written, if you've made a um, spherical or a helical joint. Okay, so which we've seen, we've, we've seen mobile manipulators that have like little, you know, they, they spin their torso up on a, some ball joint, you know, um, at this, like a, a, a screw or a ball joint will, will mess you up. And um, the reason for that is, and the fundamental reason is that, that you're either thinking about things in sort of Cartesian coordinates, or you're thinking about them in joint coordinates. When you have to go back and forth between the two, when you mix the two, and the ball joint is exactly the case where you your, your moment, you, you change at the same time, your configuration in Cartesian space and your, your theta. That's what messes you up. But everything else pretty much goes through as a polynomial. There's some great tools and, and books on this. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty old. I like this is, uh, I think, um, you know, there was a time where people really thought that understanding these polynomial equations better would solve robotics and solve manipulation and do grass planning and everything. And, and at some point it, it kind of craps out because you get too many polynomials, too many equations. If you have different polynomials for every face of the mesh of your thing, then you're, you're kind of dead in the water. People still use them for proofs, but they don't often use those tools for algorithms. The, well, the other place they use those tools is for offline kinematic analysis. So in fact, I, I have a cool um, picture here. So uh, this is a four bar linkage. If you, um, you see, so, so I've got a, a joint here on the, to the world, a joint here to the world, another joint here, another joint here. But as I move this thing around, you've seen it before, it can, it can, these points can go through a whole manifold of solutions. And this point over here can similarly trace out a manifold of solutions. And that manifold is a complicated, I mean, there are cases, special cases of four bar where there's nice closed form solutions like that are tractable for you and me to write down a paper and pencil. But in ge general, this is very hard. But we have like algebraic geometry software that will try to, will solve for these paths for you and give you a global analysis to say, am I ever gonna, you know, did I just take my mechanism and, and is it ever gonna bump into this other mechanism, for instance? And for, you know, for four bar linkages, for Stuart Go platforms, you know, these kind of, uh, the, the version of four bar linkages in, the, in 3D, I guess, um, super impressive results. They use like um, this, this particular approach is using homotopy methods, which is um, they're actually like tracing the paths of polynomials as you, as you vary a parameter through the complex plane with variable precision arithmetic. It's like doubles are not good enough. You have to like go to super high degree, you know, super high order arithmetic in order to sort of track those things without losing, you know, without uh, fixed points coming together and, and separating and all these things, but it's, it's a very rich topic. And IKFAST is a useful tool. And even though it solves primarily for the six, like it's special sauces to solve for the six DOF case, our EWA is a seven DOF robot. And, um, but you, it just by, by virtue of being able to solve the six degrees of freedom very fast, people will tend to sample in one degree of freedom and then solve the, use the six, the fast six degree of freedom solve to think of, uh, you know, almost a closed form solution for the, the seven degree of freedom problem. You have eight degrees you're screwed. But, uh, but I think seven, you can just, you can sort of sample, as a rule of thumb, you can always sample in one dimension or, or maybe a couple dimensions, but, but it gets expensive fast. Okay, so there is like a lot, to know and appreciate about closed form solutions or closed form or, you know, uh, I'd say maybe closed form is too strong, but closed form numerical solutions where you expect to get the right answer. But when I say inverse kinematics, I don't really mean those problems. And I don't really mean the problem of um, you've got an end effector pose and you have to figure out the joint angles. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that. But I think the inverse kinematics problem is actually that we care about here is much richer than that. Um, 
you have in general, you're trying to solve for some joint angles and you might have some, you know, many combinations of complex constraints that could be Cartesian or an SE3 constraints. You might have collision avoidance constraints. You might have joint angle constraints, right? It's, a, it's very much still an inverse kinematics problem of trying to take those world space constraints and turning them into a joint angle, but there's a richer form of it. And, um, you know, we use this, for instance, heavily in, on our humanoid robotics work. Okay, so this was um, a GUI that we made to make interactive inverse kinematics where we would drag around. It's true, we had an end effector constraint. We wanted the hand to be in a posi certain position, okay? Um, but we have more degrees of freedom than six here. So what do we do to, to make this fully work? Okay, well, first of all, we, I almost always have a cost function, which is like, what's the comfortable position of the robot? So Q desired is some, you know, we actually, there's like a, you know, some special numbers of like roughly a comfortable position for Atlas when this is our joint centering control, right? So, so when all of the things are equal, when, when nothing is fully specified, try to be in your comfortable position, okay? But then we also have joint limits. We would have collision avoidance constraints when we were reaching around obstacles. We had these things we called gaze constraints, which are important, super important in manipulation. It was kind of funny in on Atlas, um, the first version of Atlas, like this, um, Boston Dynamics was an awesome company to work with. This was like a, a great project. I think the first time they put a head on their robot with like a sensor head like this for us, maybe, I don't know if the team that was working on the arms wasn't talking to the team that was working on the head or whatever, but um, the perception team hated the fact that you basically, you sort of had a reachable workspace of your arms down here and your head could see like up here. And there was like a very small overlap where, where the, the places where you could actually touch your hands together that you could see was like, you know, in the super small space. So we spent a lot of time like trying to move the entire robot so that when we picked something up, we could see our hands, you know, and see what we were picking up. Uh, and that happens, I mean, you see that in mobile manipulators too. You'll see, um, you know, the arm will occlude. So, so you end up doing all kinds of gymnastics in order to, you know, to, um, to accommodate your perception system. We had another, we actually had a version of the Atlas hand that had cameras on the palm, which is like such a good idea, it seems like, until you realize that when every time you pick something up and you actually want to see something, it's, it's like you're, you know, putting the, the mug in front of your camera. And so it's, it was sort of, Rare, not as useful as you would think, but there was a case where we would we had a hard time seeing the thing we were manipulating. So we used our left hand and just kind of put it out and just made sure that whatever we were doing, we kept the task in the viewpoint, in the gaze of our camera, right? So there's just a geometric cone coming out from the camera. And we said, you know, the, the, these points of interest had to stay inside that cone. So the, the constraint on the arm was this gaze constraint. When we were doing manipulation, we wanted the feet to stay put, we wanted to stay balanced, so our kinematic constraint saying that the center of mass of the robot had to be over the support polygon of the, of the feet. Right, this was a very much richer form of inverse kinematics, but still the goal is to desire to, to just find a joint angle. Okay. Another, so, <clears throat> you know, in Drake, we do have a pretty rich library of these constraints. You don't have to use the inverse kinematics um, class to do it, but this just wraps it up and makes it convenient for you. Um, you can add position constraints, orientation constraints, gaze constraints, angle between vector constraints, minimum distance constraints. We'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. Um, you know, the, the non-collision constraints and the way that you write them can matter a lot on, on how well the solver can, solvers can deal with them. Just a, you know, a, a pretty good list of different constraints. And actually we, um, we had more in the older version that we will we'll just bring them back as, as long as, whenever somebody needs them. But um, think of a, having a library of sort of the geometry of you know, the types of constraints you'd want to add to your manipulator. And then um, you know, we'd always add sort of a joint centering constraint. And that's the inverse kinematics problem I wanna spend more time thinking about here.
quick fun one, but uh, you know, in, in the DRC, basically the, they gave us this big humanoid and they gave us a little car and the, the job of trying to figure out how the robot was going to fit in the car was pretty complicated. So this, this like inverse um, kinematics, interactive inverse kinematics library was essential to try to figure out, you know, how we were going to move and fit that big robot in the little car. Okay. And the cool thing about all these kinematics routines and the model-based dynamics things is you just snap in a different robot. We had a, we got a Valkyrie and we could do all the same things with all the same code. Your piano. <laughs> I missed the I missed the context for that by seeing it late. Uh, in motion planning, man, who wants to be doing that? But yes, how do I move my piano? Yes, yes, the, the <laughs> classic man, piano movers problem. Okay, so um, let's dig in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the the problem of writing this um, these constraints, I, I had it on the slide. But I think the richer form, I want you to think about inverse kinematics. As a constrained optimization. And the big thing that this does um, compared to the closed form solutions, you know, the closed form solutions are only equality constraints typically. So if you have exactly a, se a set of equations that spe specifies the pose of your hand, then you can put those in as polynomial uh, equations and finding the zeros of the set of polynomial equality equations um, is, the, is the stuff of where that gives out these closed form solutions. But um, we want, first of all, we want inequality constraints. Both in terms of you know, joint angles, right? but also in terms of like collision avoidance, right? Which is like the sine distance between given my Q, between my robot and the world, for instance, has got to be greater than some, um, than some threshold. Okay, and we'll talk about it exactly how to write those. Um, so once you get in the land of, of inequality constraints, then if you stayed if in the polynomial analysis, you're, you've entered the realm of uh, semi-algebraic geometry and the tools are still strong, mathematically th strong, but numerically um, they don't go as far for you. There's less you can do. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, I don't like the fact, but, but basically once you get to these sort of geometric queries of the complexity of sine distance function or whatever, we're just gonna say these are Nonlinear constraints, and we're going to have to do nonlinear optimization to deal with them. Okay. I'm not asking them for, for them to be convex. I'm not saying anything about them. We're going to solve it with a nonlinear optimization. And for the most part, you saw it in my little atlas slide there, but um, people have different philosophies here. I tend to talk about constraints more than other people, I think. Um, other people will, will write big, um, complicated cost functions. I like to try to have my cost function be minimal. Um, Joint centering. Now that's um, that's a philosophy that I've earned by spending lots of times tweaking cost functions <laughs> uh, on nonlinear optimization, and you will you will eventually do that too, I think, um, but. The problem is if you say, um, if you write, uh, so let me see, I don't recommend, although you'll see it in reinforcement learning, you'll see it all over the place, writing an objective function 
of the form q minus q zero squared plus, I don't know, 0 0.9 of SDF something squared plus, I don't know, 1.2376 times uh, my feet are, you know, something like this. And there's a game there that happens, which is you start, you add all the terms you want, fine, I think that's good. But then getting these coefficients right is um, is a slippery slope and where you end up, you know, hand engineering your, your cost functions to the point where I think it's, um, it's unclear if you've done less work than just writing the motion plan yourself. I don't see that. I'm just trying to make a point. I don't, so, you know, I'm making a, a slightly extreme point there, but um, I, I believe that it's better to write these things down as constraints and then use rigorous approaches to penalty methods to add these things in and think of them as Lagrange multipliers or whatever and, uh, and solve those numbers automatically. But if you can say something more specific about, I really don't want my feet to slip, or I don't, I really want to make sure my head can see the mug, then if there, if there's a chance to say something as a hard constraint, I think you'll be better off and you'll do less tuning in your life when you do. <clears throat> okay, so before we talked about these differential, these differential IK solvers, <clears throat> Right, so um, we wrote our original um, trajectory motion planning using the pseudo inverse of the Jacobian, right? And and so let's just think about what we did there and how we somehow got this far without solving the inverse kinematics problem. So we started with our robot in some initial pose. We computed the the pose of the hand given the joints. We did forward kinematics. And we set that as our initial target configuration of the hand, right? And then when we moved it, we designed a smooth path and just, um, just tracked that velocity with this differential kinematics in order to find the new solution. If you were to think about that in the, the land of optimization here, effectively what we did, this was the, that was a very um, physical way to write a gradient descent algorithm. If you were to instead say, what's the solution of my, you know, what's a good inverse kinematic solution for this hand posture over here? You could do it by taking your initial guess, which is your current joint angles, taking the gradient of your constraints, which is exactly your Jacobian in that case, and then doing gradient descent, and it will basically be doing the differential inverse kinematics solver, okay? So in the simple case of where we only cared about our hand, then really, differential and inverse kinematics is just incrementally solving the same problem I'm advocating we solve here. And by virtue of having these nonlinear solvers and the gradient descent, you understand that even though there were two solutions to my robotic arm, right, it's going to find the one, it's just going to find the one that's closest, right? So if I started in a configuration, I've got so many colors I should use here. If I started in a configuration like this, and I asked it to go into this configuration, then it will probably you know, find this set of joint angles just by virtue of walking the solution towards here, by taking the Jacobian, changing the, the Q gradually, it'll snap into here, okay? If I had started with some initial configuration way over here, it probably would find this solution, okay? And the same thing's gonna happen. It's really um, the same, you know, all we're doing here is making a richer specification with potentially more constraints. But in the simple case, it's exactly what we did before. Okay. <clears throat> now in practice, the one that we use most often, although my faith has been shaken, is we use these, these snopped, which is, uh, It's the thing that mathematical program calls when you call solve, if you don't specify anything more specifically. And that's doing sequential quadratic optimization. So if I have some complex 
nonlinear function and complex constraints, then, then a sequential non a quadratic optimization is if I have some initial guess here, I'll make a local quadratic approximation of this by taking just the derivatives of that. Um, I mean, it's, it's estimating the second derivative, but it's, it's only taking the first derivative, um, making a quadratic approximation, jumping straight to this solution, taking a new optimization and, and continuing. So it's convergence rate, we expect to be faster than gradient descent on simple problems like this. Um, so that's that's why we we like it, and it, it does well in these constrained versions compared to gradient descent. You have to do some more tricks to, to get the constraints in, um, but its behavior of around local minima, unless you get lucky and happen to jump over a local minima, but really its behavior is just as local as as if you were doing gradient descent. So in the same way that I'm going to find the one of the the many solutions to my kinematics problem with gradient descent, I'll find one of the many solutions here. And we did see that problem in, um, uh, you know, in the humanoids, for instance, and we see it also in the in just the EWA examples. But in in the um, on the humanoid interface, you would that's why there was this little ghost of the robot that was uh, that would always draw before it actually moved was because we wanted to make sure that it, that the inverse kinematics didn't find some strange local minima that would send the robot spinning off. So, so we, we would always have a, a human just watch and say, yep, yeah, okay, that's okay, yep, that's okay, that's okay, and let it go. Questions? Okay, now I really wanna make, if, if there's one thing, what's the relationship between snopped and, yes, so, um, they are they are closely related. There's a family of second order methods, and uh, I th I think the SQP methods tend to be using uh, something like Levenberg Marquette uh, in, in on the inner loop. Um, and oh, so, yeah, why was my face? You're gonna make me say it. Um, I mean, we've just so uh, let's see. Snopped is um, is an awesome solver. It's we've we've leaned on it hard. I've seen people outperform it. With um, with different numerical recipes recently, and um, and we've had some just some silly issues with it with versions of SNOP acting very differently and stuff like this. But um, the fact that that everybody can use SNOP is a big deal. Um, they the the authors of SNOP were very generous to let us um, to redistribute it inside the Drake binaries. Uh, that was it's not it's actually something you normally would have to pay for. These days. Um, there are ways that people, uh, so an alternative way, uh, an alternative to SQP would be to do a, even a first order like gradient descent for, or something, um, but to use an unconstrained solver and use uh, some form of clever penalty method in order to push the constraints into the um, into the objective, and then. In practice, I've seen people solve these very, very quickly. So um, augmented Lagrangian is an approach for moving um, for adding constraints to the objective. But scheduling the penalty on those constraints in a rigorous way so that when the, the optimization converges, you have satisfied your constraints. And it does this in a way that, that uh, is, I think, very uh, efficient in, in the optimization. That's a big question. So isn't that what a lot of common RL algorithms would do these days? So it's true. So reinforcement learning um, most approach, almost all approaches to reinforcement learning uh, try to solve an unconstrained optimization problem. They don't talk about constraints um, natively. Uh, it would be very hard to, especially in the model-free case. There are people talking about how do you do, how would you ever prove you don't violate a constraint in a, with, if you don't have a model? Um, <clears throat> so it tends to be objective only, no constraints. And people definitely put things that I would have put as a constraint into their objective. Sometimes they do it 
I would say most of the time they do it by picking numbers. I mean, that's just the way I think there's a lot of tuning. There are some approaches to trying to pick the objective function more rigorously, but I would say most of the time reinforcement learning is still in the space just because we're, we're still new at it and everything, but where people are doing a lot of cost function tuning. Okay, so, so let me try to make, um, make the point that I, was, I started with, which is that I think if you understand inverse kinematics well, and you understand how to write those constraints and how to use that library of constraints, then you, you go, it goes a long way to solving the motion planning problem. And here's the example that I want to use to think about. So this is, um, this is the familiar dish loading, but let me, I want you to watch this carefully. So uh, the first mug, was on its side, okay? And actually the robot is able to move that all the way through. This is an older video where we, our planning time was still a little slow, um, <clears throat> okay? But the robot's able to go directly into the um, dishwasher with that, although it took, it, it did drop it a little bit. Ah, oh, I did it again, I, cl I thought I clicked. Okay. Flat mug, thank you for telling me, Alex. Um, flat mug, the robot's able to pick, um, pick up the mug and go all the way straight to the, after a little bit of planning time, go all the way straight to the sink or to the, to the dishwasher rather. But if you think about it, when the mugs are facing up in the sink, that's the hard case, right? And if you watch what the robot has to do after it's a little bit of planning time here, okay. It has to do some gymnastics, okay? We set it down on the, on the mat there. We do more planning in order to get to a, be able to pick the mug up in a place that we can actually go and set it down directly in the sink. And if you get one thing out of this lecture, I want you to understand that um, there's a problem with the object centric grasp planning we've talked about so far, which is you just look at the object you want to pick up and think about what's a good antipodal place to pick it up or whatever. The problem is that almost all there, there's another set of constraints if you want to set it down, for instance, and um, or if you want it to stay inside your camera. Or I think the, um, the the constraints that come from the robot and the task, even the downstream task in my experience, often dominate the, the choice of where you should grasp, okay? So the grasp, a grasp planning that doesn't think at all about where you're gonna set it down is going, not gonna be able to do a task like this. The, the location where we picked, we chose to pick up the mug on the mug, the orientation of the mug relative to the hand was completely dominated by where we could set it down and the kinematics of the arm. Okay, so um, I think it's very important to think about uh, grasp planning as just another, through the lens of, of inverse kinematics. Now, <clears throat> um, this is the stepping stone to full-on motion planning, but actually we can do a lot already with, um, with solving two inverse kinematics problems um, for the robot. So if you think about the mug uh, uh, reorientation problem, in some sense we have two optimization, two IK problems. The first one is to minimize my initial Q, let's say, with Q minus Q nominal. Let me be a little more careful with mine. Let me pick Q at time zero, since I used Q zero before. <clears throat> 
subject to, for instance, the mug in pre-grasp. Antipodal, whatever you like here. I have a second one, which I'd like to, to solve for the final time, T final, let's say. I'd like it to be in a comfortable position. With a mug scroll position relative is, you know, is inside grasp, right? And what, what connects those two? If you solve those independently, then there's nothing to, pre to prevent you from picking a grasp in the first step. If you solve the two problems separately, if you solve that first one, you could find yourself um, you know, out of luck with the sort of second step. So what connects those two? There's some cost or constraint or something that connects those two. Right, there's some extra constraint that the mug has to be in the same orientation relative to the hand. Right, somehow the object's pose relative to the gripper, which we could write as some complicated function of Q and X object. That's just the kinematics, but we've you know turned it to some you know the kinematics minus uh, you know the and then the, the, the final transform to get me into the relative frame. And there's some extra constraint which says that my initial object position, you know, the, the pose of the object relative to the hand has to be the same as in my final object position. As a result, the way that we find ourselves solving these problems is to solve a richer inverse kinematics problem. So I'll minimize over Q0 and QT final, let's say, those costs. This is a summing, um, Nominal distances is not offensive in my mind. Uh, sorry if that sounds arbitrary. Should I make that sound less arbitrary? I mean, there's a there's a natural norm that connects those two. If they're they're exactly the same, um, they're the same. They live in the same space, so weighting them equally or or whatever I think is completely uh, fine. All these constraints, including um, this. So, what's the complexity of that? Right, we we've doubled our number of decision variables, um, <clears throat> but but we were already solving inverse kinematics problems on Atlas which is um, you know, 73 uh, state variables because of that quaternion. Um, 
uh, you know, big, relatively big problems at interactive rates. So these inverse kinematic solvers um, are, are fast enough to handle this kind of thing. And this is maybe what we're going to do even before we take a motion. You can see in that video that, that um, you know, there's times where your first version of your kinematic planner might be a little slow and the robot will pause between motions. And that's kind of something that your robot friends will make fun of you for, but you can speed it up, tend to, tend to speed it up. Okay, but, but this is still a small problem in, our, in this space. And, um, and the virtue of solving those jointly is that now I can actually choose a grasp configuration, constraining that, I can, that the same grasp I picked it up in with is something I can also put it down with. And what happened in that TRI video was that when the mug was flat on the, uh, on the bottom of the, it was on its side, sorry, on the bottom of the, of the sink, it is possible to find to solve two IK problems, one that goes, you know, one that picks up the mug there and sets it down directly in the top. So it was so it so having successfully solved those, it decided to plan all the way to the completion. Okay. But on the second one, when they're facing above, that it's not possible to find a solution to do that. And it resorts by we have a, a higher level uh, planner that just said when that happens, put the mug down on the top and then solve another set of, of trajectory optimization problems in order to, to find those, uh, that reorientation thing, and then you can get it into the sink, okay? So solving two IK problems already opens up a lot of space for you to do, um, to do more impressive manipulation. In some sense, connecting those two, when the, when the task is like this, it's fairly open, uh, workspace and there's not a lot of kinematic constraints sort of in between. Once I have the mug in the hand, you know, I, we've got to make sure we don't smash it into the side of the sink or, or, you know, there's a couple things, but, but actually the motion planning there uh, is relatively simple having designed our, our grasps. But even this, there's another trick that's sitting inside here, which if I were to say, I have a desired final position. We, we definitely, um, the problem in this case gives us the initial configuration of the, of the mug. So it gives us this sort of um, X object at time zero. X object at time T final um, might have some flexibility, right? We could specify exactly the pose we want the mug to end up in, but if we don't have to, then you should, you should specify exactly what you need and nothing more as a, as a set of, um, of constraints on the pose of the final object that may not be equality constraints, but may instead be, um, be inequality constraints that allow me to have a range of solutions, a, a range of possible um, putting down configurations. And if you noticed when, the, when it was putting the mug down in the sink, it just barely got its hand you know, uh, above the, the, ra the rail of the sink drawer, uh, of the dishwasher drawer. I don't know why I keep screwing that up. Then, uh, and, and that was not its preference, but it was the only um, grasp it could find in order to, to satisfy the pre-grasp and post-grasp constraints. Have the, the flexibility, uh, use it. And that's where the rich um, constraints that, that I was talking about come in. So, so the GUI that you'll have tonight, uh, one of them, will be uh, this problem. So if I have, if I have my, my full EWA, full robot going down to the base, okay, um, <clears throat> in 3D, but that is beyond my drawing capabilities. And you just want it to grab a handrail. Okay, so let's say I've got a cylinder, a very long cylinder. Okay, which is think of that as a an exaggerated coffee cup. Okay, but let's say I just want to grab grab the cylinder. Um, what we've done before is, for instance, sampling antipodal grasps of this, um, you know, on this, and then asking the inverse kinematics, and you can do that. But for something for a simpler geometry like this. Um, if we know that it's a cylinder, for instance, you can actually write much better constraints. So here, here's a quick, um, you know, sort of check yourself. 
how would you write the constraints of, of the hand being aligned in sort of a nice way with the, with the cylinder? Let's say we want it to, to be like this, but we don't care where on the cylinder or even what orientation relative to the cylinder, right? All I care about is that I'm gonna get a nice, you know, a nice antipodal grasp on the cylinder there. I wanna somehow write the constraints down that would be the man, that would give me the, the most degrees of freedom to play with um, around picking, you know, picking up this cylinder. And how many degrees of freedom? How many constraints, let's say? I'd actually like you to think through and like, if you were to code it, what would you, what would you write? Here's what I would do. If I, but if anybody wants to tell me what they, what, how would you write it? Anybody willing to? Um, I guess. Uh... One thing you could do is align, I guess it would be like the Y axis and the end effector frame with the like center axis of the, whatever we call it, a rail or the extended coffee mug. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yep. So, so what we want is somehow, if I have my gripper here, I have the Y axis, let's say, is that the Y? I think so. Then, um, Remember this is X, yeah, that's Y. Yeah. And then um, we want that to be lined up with the extrude, extruded cylinder, the long axis of the cylinder. Now, if we also care about, um, I mean, so, so you could ask yourself how many degrees of freedom that is, but, I'll, but maybe I'll give you my version of this because it, um, it will solve the other problem too. If we have a finite cylinder, maybe we also care about eventually not going off the end. Uh, it is actually a coffee cup. So, um, so here's how I would write it, and how we did. I did write it, and how you'll be able to play with it. So the interface I'm going to give you tonight is a big um, cylinder that you can move around, and the the robot will solve its inverse kinematics problem to track it if it wants to. But if you move it like this, the robot's just going to ignore you until it gets to the end, and then it would pull, right? And if you rotate it, uh, you can't tell that I'm rotating it. But if you just rotate it around its axis, the robot will just sit there happy. As a clam, the inverse kinematic solution won't change. Okay, so how do you write that? Um, the way I wrote it last night is I in the y-axis of the gripper. So now I'm gonna um, in the RGB space here. I guess that's the y-axis there. I said that there is a point roughly here and a point roughly here. 
along that y-axis, okay? I would like this point in the cylinder coordinates to be exactly on the axis. And I would like this point on the cylinder coordinates to be exactly on the axis. So you don't have to, you can write a dot product or whatever. Uh, Anabau's version maybe would have done the vector version of that, but I can do the sampling version of that. If those two are both on the long axis of the cylinder, then, um, then it's easy to, to have written the same constraint. And one extra bonus is I can also say that if they if the cylinder has finite extent, then those things being inside the length of the cylinder, right, in the cylinder coordinates is enough to keep me on the cylinder axis. The same geometric computation can solve for both, both of those constraints, which is why, and you can give yourself a little um, wiggle room for how close you're willing to go to the, explicitly give yourself a, a, a threshold on how close you're willing to go to the edge of the cylinder by just thinking about those points being separated from the gripper a little bit along the axis. Yeah. So that extra flexibility of being able to, you know, turn this around and the robot will kind of ignore the things that don't matter will make all the difference if you're loading the, the sink or in any other sort of uh, loading the dishwasher or, or any other sort of, uh, you know, more complicated, more constrained manipulation problem. Now, I hope you see that we're actually almost there. So now how do we do kinematic motion planning? There's, there's a, we're gonna look at the sampling based version, which maybe people will have been more familiar with. There's, there's sampling based versions of this uh, that we can talk about next time, but there's a lot of people um, that have done extremely well with just making this optimization that we did with, with two samples for IK, suddenly be lots of samples for IK along the length of an entire trajectory, okay? I'll talk about exactly the, the splines that we might, you, you might wanna use uh, in a second, but you just parameterize Q as now a trajectory over time and then add IK constraints at sample points along the trajectory. And that is a surprisingly effective way to do trajectory optimization. The details of how you write the spline um, matter. Certainly the details of the way, how you write the constraints matter, but at a high level, all we're doing is solving multiple IK problems along the trajectory. So if we're reorienting the mug, we just solve a handful of more trajectories you know, that orient the arm around the mug um, and this, again, once you've picked up the mug, write only the constraints you absolutely need because any freedom you can leave for your solver to, to walk around and find a solution is gonna make the problem easier. So once you've picked up the mug, the mug needs to stay in the same relative pose of the hand. Oftentimes we will make the mug pose uh, a decision variable in the optimization too, okay? And you don't want, you, you, you don't want your mug to run into the world as you move it around. You don't want your arm to move it through the world, but those are still just a list of inverse kinematics geometry constraints. And you solve a bunch of them, 10, 40, um, and, and, and you can accomplish these compl pretty complicated tasks. So for instance, this is, um, this is an example from um, Danny uh, and, and Mark Toussaint. Um, this shows more than what I'm saying. They are also um, using trajectory optimization to solve for the decision, the discrete decision of which box to move when. But, um, but the core technology there is just trajectory optimization over time um, to design even where you grasp and coordinate so the robots don't run into each other. It's all just solving trajectory, you know, IK problems effectively along the trajectory. And you can do pretty complicated stuff. 
This was um, the more probably the most complicated geometric thing we had to do with Atlas. We had to pull boulders out of a or like these two by fours out of a pile um, because you know it was uh, disaster response scenario and a bunch of stuff had fallen down in front of the door and we had to clear the door in order to move it. So we had a big uh, robot picking up two by fours and moving them around. Okay, and this trajectory, which had to avoid, it sort of had to play Plinko with, or not Jenga with, uh, with uh, you know, with these two by fours, but we could do that with trajectory optimization. This is sort of on the verge where maybe you wouldn't expect trajectory optimization to, to, to be extremely good and you might need a more advanced, a more sampling based approach. I, okay, this uh, raises a very good point about RL. The end-to-end -end pixels to torque pipeline is a little overhyped. Learning the target's waypoints to pass in a trajectory optimization has led to some nice results. Yes, so um, thank you for saying that. I think that uh, uh, it is, I, that I, if there's one thing that I want people to come away with at the end of the course is that RL is, a, is super good and fills in a lot of details, but there are some parts of the pipeline that we understand very well and you should use them when it doesn't add uh, assumptions that you are worried about. There's a view of RL which says that anything that, uh, you know, any human engineered piece of the pipeline that you've inserted into your, into your pipeline is like a bottleneck that learning can't get around and you've constrained your solution space. I guess I still think that you need that stuff to make it work. So yes, planning in the space of, of waypoints can be better, planning with forces instead of end effectors uh, positions can be better in for all the reasons that we understand and know with with these approaches. I'm going to put that up so I don't forget, but I'm going to go back to the whiteboard here. Okay, so um, so how do we parameterize QT? Two common choices. QT. One would be the piecewise polynomials that we have already used in order to interpolate our end effectors. So um, you could say the Q of T is some coefficients So we would, would have our um, parameterization in time, we have T0, T1, T2, T3, you name it, okay? You might have some points here and you would define over each interval a polynomial trajectory, which is described by the coefficients of some polynomial up to some degree. We tend to use cubic polynomials. And they're, they have nice properties, especially for initializing. Um, so that'll have four parameters, the coefficient for the zero up to three, right? And um, and we can we can solve for a handful of of these things for each interval of time, we'll write a, uh, a piecewise polynomial. Evaluating Q of T at any finite, uh, any, any particular sample point is a simple equation. And taking the gradients of this with respect to the coefficients alpha is a simple thing for our optimizer to do. So we can write our constraints just at the sample points, like I said, but and we, we often do write our more interesting constraints only at the sample points. But sometimes um, you'll get to this, this you want to trade off um, how many decision variables, but versus how dense you want your constraints to be. So you can also choose to somehow sample your constraints more densely, even with a, 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 a smaller number of not points. So for instance, collision avoidance constraints, a lot of times people will have the experience that they will find a plan, which is like, great, it's out of collision here, it's out of collision here, but because I've interpolated through, it actually would have collided as it went from one knot point to the other. 
And the simplest solution to that is to just, um, there are ways to, to make a convex hull and make it uh, complete, but I think the simplest solution is just to sample finely and add multiple constraints without increasing the, the number of cues that you're trying to search over. The other super common one is um, B splines. Bazir splines, okay. Um, these have a slightly different uh, picture instead of having this sort of the coefficients of, of a piecewise polynomial like this, they are parameterized by some control points. Um, so if I were to just plot it in space, let's see, Q1, Q2, I actually think about parameterizing some particular canonical uh, points in that space. And there's a set of equations of how those points pull the solution over time that will give me a trajectory that, that comes out. And as I move those points around, it pulls on the trajectory. And all that matters really is that, well, the first thing that matters is that I, by moving those points, I can control the trajectory and get all the rich trajectories I want. The, um, it's just, just a slightly different parameterization, the B-spline parameterization. But it's, it can be very nice for motion planning problems like this because it has a property that those, um, the interpolating functions that connect those points together guarantee that your trajectory stays inside the convex hull of those points. So you can, if, if you want to make a, have some guarantee, you know, there's, there's really nothing to guarantee that a cubic spline doesn't sort of overshoot or, or, or go under sort of and, and leave. If you, if you for instance, uh, had hard joint limit constraints here, it could be that you'd even violate your joint limits as you, uh, as you interpolate it through your polynomial. And this has, uh, has stronger guarantees, for instance, for joint limits. Okay. Now the last thing to do is to um, is to connect those all these um, these knot points along our trajectories together. So we need some constraints that somehow say um, I didn't just teleport directly to the to the end. And you can do that. Um, oh, sorry. Good. The piecewise approach. approach um, asks about differentiability of well-behavedness at the, at the points. So good. So uh, in the piecewise polynomials, uh, we can often constrain them to be continuous if we, if we like, uh, and even smooth. That's a, uh, but a lot of times we'll just add that as an additional constraint to the optimizer. So you'll say, I have coefficients alpha, um, you know, the, and I, I would like it to be that the final, I'm, I'm, the final point here of this spline must match the, the initial point of this spline. That's a constraint that you'll add to your optimization. Similarly, the derivative at this point might match the derivative there if you care about smoothness in time. Good. So, um, so in the in the B spline, I'm sorry, asking. I'm answering Rebecca's question now. So, um, in the B spline case, this convex hull property gives you gives you something you can say over the entire interval. Unfortunately, if we're doing our optimization in joint space, then it, it will, for instance, allow you to say that it never violated any joint uh, limit. But as a collision avoidance constraint, it's not quite what you'd want. Um, we tend to write these optimize, optimizations in joint space instead of in um, Cartesian space because you want because you do have joint limits and you, you want you need to be able to express things both in Cartesian and joint, and it's much e easier to have the unique mapping from um, joint to Cartesian instead of the, the inverse kinematics. Uh, so you so if you tried to write a B spline in Cartesian space, you could say something about guaranteeing that you didn't run into obstacles or something like that. But it turns out, as good as that sounds, we we tend to not do it. We tend to stay stay in joint space. So the other way that people do it is that that you can um, you can try to have a you can try to take the geometry of your robot at time. T at t equals four uh, and at t equals five, and make a convex hull of the geometry. And if you can somehow guarantee that that convex hull is in um, out of collision, and uh, uh, guarantee that your trajectory stays inside that convex hull, which can be hard, then you can make stronger guarantees. But that's like a lot of making new meshes right at runtime for your for your collision engine, and tends to be not uh, not our favorite thing to do. Do you 
if you take that convex hole that you drew around your um, representation, can you map that into Cartesian space? And does that give you anything? Yeah. So um, it's not that you can't. It's just not easy because it would be the it would be the mapping through some complicated nonlinear function. So um, that's where sampling starts coming in. Uh, but so, so it's easy to sample from that mapping and it's hard to, to actually move that hull through. It would even gain faces, drop faces. It, it can do all kinds of super weird stuff. Yeah, super tempting to do that. Okay, the other big thing that people do that you, you can do uh, is you can go into configuration space and I it's almost, my gosh, I, if I didn't say this, I'd be in trouble. Um, so, so the other thing you can do is if you know the geometry of your robot, um, uh, in certain cases, it's harder to do in the, the full glory of, of a seven degree of freedom robot because your configuration space blows up into those dimensions. But in certainly in the simple robot case, you can add basically your collision geometry onto the objects and add a buffer that is the right sort of size and avoid collisions that way. But it's very hard to do that in the high dimensional uh, configuration space. So people would do that for um, wheeled robots very, very effectively, but for high dimensional robots, not so much. Awesome questions, yeah. Okay, so um, so uh, the other way that, so there's continuity constraints that you'd add. The other way that you would somehow, the other constraints you would need to add in order to guarantee that, that these constraints stay reasonable between each other is some notion of velocity constraints, for instance, that you can't in from times T0 to T1 go too far or you know, or, or teleport for too great of a distance so that my samples will get too, too small, um, or too far apart. So you tend to, so the nice thing about these two parameterizations, both piecewise polynomial and B splines, is that their derivatives stay in class. So, so their derivatives, um, the, the derivatives of time here, so if I wanted to write Q dot, I just get a piecewise polynomial of degree less, one less. Same thing happens to be true for a B spline. So it turns out that you can take the derivative of this in time and describe it with a B spline of degree one less. Okay. Um, and, and that allows you to then write similar constraints on the velocities or on the accelerations. Okay. And the velocity constraints are what's going to keep you sort of reasonable that you can't move too far. And we put those in, remember, on the um, even on our differential IK solution. Good. So the, um, if those of you that have uh, taken underactuated, um, this is actually very different than the, op the trajectory optimization. Well, to me, it looks very different to the, the trajectory optimization we do in underactuated, because there, all of the interesting constraints are on the dynamics. And, um, and we end up worrying very much about the slope of the curves and like, how do we parameterize that carefully and write the dynamics in. In manipulation, as much as I like the dynamics, the dynamics are sort of the last thing that matters, right? So, so in practice, we can add um, the dynamics of the arm, right? Are often not the thing that matters until you're really trying to, to operate at the limits of your robot. But in this formulation, without adding any equations of motion of the robot to the problem, we can add position, velocity, acceleration constraints. If you needed to add torque limit constraints, then you would have to add additional constraints that would say, put in the equations of motion, my mass, my Coriolis, my gravity terms, in order to compute the torque as a function of these Qs and add that as a constraint. We tend to not do that. Um, it's just a lot more machinery to add a little bit more and acceleration constraints often are close enough to, if you're conservative in accelerations, then you're often good for torques. If you really, like I said, if every second counts, because um, you're picking something all day long or whatever, then, then it might be worth the extra cost. Cool, okay. And the last point, just so I have exactly one minute maybe, um, we talked about the key point optimization last time. And um, this, con uh, this idea that you should constrain exactly what you need to constrain and nothing more is exactly what, what I was trying to say in the key point section before, right? So you can estimate the pose of the mug but if you don't need it, then you shouldn't, right? Because it, it's harder for your perception system and it's gonna ultimately be harder for your planning system. 
if all that matters is that the point on the the in the handle ends up on the you know on the rack then my trajectory planning only needs to think about that and the only information it needs from the perception system is the key point so this notion of in fact it was this thinking about writing minimal constraints in kinematics that i think uh inspired the work to, to, re to reduce our perception system to key points because that's all we were actually using from the perception system okay cool so the question on the survey which i will put back up here is uh, just let us know how you're feeling about the projects and uh what we can do to help and of course any other general questions and i will see you thursday Terry, are you going to pop the link in maybe even the forms here Let's see if i can do it How about that Russ, can I, can I ask a question about your last point? Um, is there yeah. something about not caring about the dynamics that makes it um, faster for uh, motion planning? Because I feel like, you know, if you're running direct collocation with snop and stuff, it takes like minutes or, um, you know, perhaps hours before it finally converges. And I'm just wondering if these kind of problems are faster in practice. These problems are faster in practice. Um, I think it's, uh there's a couple things happening in that observation of yours i think that um when the dynamics represent strong constraints then adding them will make the optimization harder if you have if you have dynamic constraints that are often not active right if you're really just computing a torque then you're going to pay the price here of computing those those terms in the optimum like every every evaluation of the constraint costs you a little bit of computation time, but you wouldn't expect the solver to take more iterations. If the, if the torques are not the active constraints, right? It, then it's, uh, and it won't slow down your optimization in that sense. I think in the harder underactuated optimization problems, we're both paying the price of computing the dynamics, but I think that's small. It's also that those constraints become very hard to satisfy. I see. So I just want to keep those two separate. But in practice, yes, it, these things are much faster and much more reliable than the, the dynamic optimization. I have a question along those lines as well. Yeah. If, if you have um, an object that you're picking up that has some sizable weight to it, then wouldn't that pretty easily violate the acceleration constraints of the joints themselves if you're moving it around within the acceleration limits, you're like, I'm sorry, wouldn't you violate your torque constraints? Yeah, yeah, so um, you're right. Maybe I'm being spoiled by having a big KUKA and a little mug or something, right? But uh, if, you're a, yes. if you're like a UR3 picking up a milk jug, uh, then you're in the torque limit regime. Um, although the UR3, it's hard to compute torques too. So you know, it's hard to have the model. So. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's when the, there are there are cases where the load is high, where that matters. Uh, the difference between acceleration and torques matters. Okay, just checking. <laughs> no, it's good. But even then, um, I think a torque constraint, like an inequality constraint that is not not zero. Um, is is easier than an under a fully underactuated constraint to Terry's problem. The, the underactuation is the limit where the, the torque limits are zero in both act. You know, on some effectively some joints don't have an actuator, so the torques are are some are zero on both sides, and that tends to squeeze the the problem in a in a way that can be hard for the solvers. But st I, I still think they work well for a lot of problems. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, like we should try and unconstrain the, the optimization as much as we can. Is it like depending on the optimization solve, like if you're using a like a Monte Carlo method, would it be, you know, I, I could kind of envision a scenario where adding constraints, even if they're not like hard constraints, actually speeds up finding a solution because um, it's like, I guess, like tunnel visions to solve it. 
Good. My point was, as I thank you for asking. My point was more about um, the existence of solutions than the than the efficiency of the solver, right? So, if if I asked, if I had specified a specific pose, I wouldn't have been able to find any solution that would have flipped the mug over and put it into the sink, for instance, in that example. Um, whether it speeds up or slows down the solver is a very subtle thing. There are cases where you're right, where the um, where adding constraints can actually help the solver. Um, and there's other cases where it'll make the problem much harder. So uh, one of the weird ones, for instance, is that, um, and it speaks to your point, uh, we find often that, um, you, I don't know if you know the direct versus shooting analogy, uh, in trajectory optimization, but you can write trajectories that, um, that basically Think, think, think of how I can say it in this in this context. Uh, it's more about it's it's more important when you're um, writing your constraints and your torques as a decision variable. But um, so so let me just give the case because I don't think it, it, I think it's trivial in this case. But in the case where you have a control inputs as decision variables, you have a trajectory of control inputs. You can solve for your dynamics by just simulating along the whole entire trajectory to, to write constraints on Q, for instance. Um, or you can write Q and U both as decision variables and put constraints ac across them. Um, and when you do that, you can actually break up the problem like we do here, where you write each segment as a different set of constraints. You're adding decision variables, you're adding tons of constraints, but we find that the solvers are faster, right? Um, often. Uh, because, part, I mean, the, the constraints you're adding have a particular sparsity structure. Um, the conditioning of the constraints tends to be much, They, if you think about it, like a polynomial can go wrong pretty badly over some long interval and it doesn't have, the numerics are just better to, to do it over some small interval. So there's a whole discussion there about, uh, but there are certainly cases where adding variables and constraints can actually speed up the solver. So, so in, in that example, the direct would be kind of more efficient than the shooting method. It's a hotly debated topic, but, <laughs> right. but, but, but we, uh, we have found that. In my, in my experience, we found that. Uh, the, one, the, the one problem is, yeah, the one thing that has shaken my, my faith a little bit is that I think the fastest solvers out there right now tend to be unconstrained solvers um, with like augmented Lagrangian putting the constraints across. And um, I think it's for subtle reasons. Like uh, you don't have to pay the interface cost of going to the commercial solver and stuff like this. Um, uh, I don't know if it's a fundamental cost, but I think right now the fastest solvers are not the direct solvers. So the tides turn sometimes. Thanks. Yeah. Right. I always thought you couldn't guarantee um, the constraint satisfaction for uh, the uh, penalty methods or, well, the augmented Lagrangian methods. Right? Good. So, so. Um, some people just put penalty terms in there with some coefficients and, and try to you know, make themselves uh, content with the relative balance of cost. The augmented Lagrangian approach or a, a more, you know, there are, there are penalty based approaches which basically turn that coefficient of your constraint effectively to infinite, infinity, but you schedule that, that turning up the cost of the constraint so that you guide your, your problem from unconstrained to constrained. So the augment of the Grangian to, some, to is the same numerical limits uh, as, a, as a constraint solver will eventually satisfy the constraints, but it has a different path to get there. I see, so similar to interior point, Kevin, like in, in, the, in the sense that you were- A nonlinear interior point? I mean, so, so some of the convex interior points don't have to do that because they start inside, they do a log barrier function. It is very related to the log barrier function. I see. Idea. I see. Yes, it, it, it's, um, but, uh, the, the geometry of it is slightly different, but, but I think conceptually it's a little like the log barrier function where you're trying to turn up that, that barrier, yes.